I'm going to bring on uh, Ranjit Bra, um, who uh, has, has got a very interesting story to talk about the intimidation that we're getting on on protests and uh, freedom of speech. Um, Ranjit, are you there? Uh, on this, like a seance, I'm, I'm, I am, I am here. Yeah. Hi, how are you? You're Kristen? here. Thanks You're for there. having me. You're there. Right. <laughs> so thank you for thank you for coming on. Um, that I mean, no, I've, I've just we've we've had yesterday. We went on the protest. I was quite intimidated by what had been said by Sunak and all the stories in the media about clamping down on these protesters. Um, we've had on this show people who've been arrested for hissing in a council meeting uh, last week. They were arrested and spent a whole day in custody. We've also spoken earlier on the show to Yale uh, Khan, who was arrested and put into into the police cell for a, a few hours, most of a day for having a sign around her neck. You were arrested as well in November at a protest. Can you tell us what happened um, and uh, why they arrested you and what happened when you were taken in by the police? Sure. Thanks, Christopher. Thanks for having me. I've been aware of your work for a long time. And I, like you, have followed the the anti-Semitism accusations that were hurled at the Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn in particular when he was there and followed the way they did that and the way they kind of weaponized the new definition of what they called anti-Semitism, the IHRA, International Holocaust Remembrance Association uh, definition of anti-Semitism, which very clearly from its outset was written in such a way not to you know, stop anti-Semitism, but to stop criticism of Israel. And in the current context of Israel literally you know, being accused and essentially the case has been upheld and is still under investigation in the ICJ of Israel's genocide. And, and I think you know, anyone looking objectively at the situation can see that. So there have been very vociferous and militant demonstrations and very well attended demonstrations on the streets of London quite persistently over a long period of time. I, like you probably, was at the 2003 Iraq war demonstration and it was a big demonstration, but it was, like a, it was almost like a one-off. There were others, but they were not of that scale. And people, once the war started, people were demoralized and kind of went home. The difference yeah. now is we got, we've got a long, quite long series of demonstrations, very militant demonstrations, very persistent, very aware that are on the streets. And I think for that reason, our government have been very persistent in their attempts to criminalize it. Calling, you know, Soella Braveman early on calling them hate marches, asking the Metropolitan Police to essentially take action. And the latest you know, reaction to George Galloway's election which was, you know, almost rabid and, and very disproportionate, um, kind of the accusation that democracy had gone wrong, that George wasn't a worthy candidate, that he was a divisive figure of hatred. And again, an incite trick against, you know, to the police to take action and we will back you. Um, perhaps, you know, that as a background, I just say very briefly my story, which is not a unique story, but, you know, I've been a political activist. I'm, I'm a surgeon in, in the National Health Service, but I'm a, I've been a political activist since before I was a medical student. So it's just a, a, another aspect of my life, which is very important to me. And part of that, my father was an Indian, he was active in the Indian Workers Association, Harpal Bra. Um, and, you know, he was a lifelong supporter of the Palestinian people, as he was a supporter of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. And the IWA, the Indian Workers Association, took those two matters to their heart and always campaigned on them, just as did the labor movement and the broader working class in Britain in general. Um, so I was at that demonstration. We have a book. It's a very nicely written book, actually, by her part. Short pamphlet of the history of Zionism. And to the history of Zionism that not everyone perhaps is aware of because it's not mentioned very, very prominently. But it's not, it's not, they're, not they're not made up, uh, you know, accusations. This is a historical fact, which is generally provable and known. But it documents various things. Things that, for example, Ken Livingston got into trouble. Ken Livingston made a, that inaccurate comparison um, ba basically, his words were something to the effect of Hitler was a Zionist, which is not right. But there was an agreement between the German Zionist organization and the SS of the Nazi party called the Havara, the transfer agreement, precisely because both organizations wanted to remove Jews from Europe and take them to Palestine for what was avowedly a colonial project from its outset. And so we had a little, we've got a little book, a pamphlet, you know, which illustrates that. And what we became aware of is that there the police are working hand in hand with Zionist organizations in the demonstrations to try and pick people out and single them out for repression by the police. And there's a little um, a Twitter 
site called at hurry up harry harry's place i don't know if you're aware of it i've seen it yeah it's got a george orwell picture bizarrely isn't it yeah it does and and so basically it, it they go around and during demonstrations they try and get people it, people think that they're speaking to, to an audience so that they're going to you know be putting arguments about the oppression of the palestinian but what this site is actually trying to do is get people to incriminate themselves unbeknownst to themselves so they often ask a bit like piers morgan questions about Hamas, questions about October 7th, try and get you into a frame where you can fall foul of the legislation and then ask the police to crack down on you. Now, we haven't done any of that, but we just had this history book. They took offence to this history book and they essentially instructed the Met Police to come for us. So the Met Police, first of all, confiscated the book. And I've got a, a kind of a conversation about that in which I'm pointing out to the officers that this is political policing and that they're not quite understanding it. But it's an interesting conversation. And then they go away. And then half an hour they, later, they came back and said, oh, no, now we have to arrest you. And nothing had happened, but they said they're arresting us under pub, uh, Section 5 and pub, Section 18 of the Public Order Act, which is threatening words and behavior. But they said, oh, but it's, it's racially aggravated. So essentially, they were accusing us for racism, for selling a history book, giving the origins and history of Zionism. Um, and, and ultimately, they, they took us to the police station. They kept us 24 hours. They raided our homes. There were four of us that they took. Um, hold and, and they had hold to... on a minute. Hold on a minute. Just that you, you, you've been, you were in prison, in prison, in the police cell for 24 hours. You just kind of uh -huh. said, I mean, how was yeah. that? I mean, is, is that... Well, you know, it, you know, the people that, you've got, of course, are, are enforcing the repression, they haven't got a clue. You know, they're politically, they're, they're, they don't know what they've been asked to do. They've been giving orders. They're following them out. Once they go through the unpleasantness of arresting you, because, you know, I was manhandled, handcuffed. It's pain. It's physically painful, undignified, and unjustified. So it's, it constitutes an assault upon your person. So once you've gone through that and you've calmed down, from that point on, you're in their hands. They treat you very decently, and most of the people who look after you don't really know what's going on. They've they got a, a way of processing you and all the rest of it. And eventually, a unit who are charged with the actual enforcement of whatever the accusation is come and see you and interview you. And I've got that recording of that interview. I think I'm going to release that on YouTube because it's very interesting as well because they're very low level and they're trying to say well are you a racist were you trying to inflame racial hatred and and of course they have no they have no knowledge of the palestinian conflict how long it's been going on for any of the background they haven't read the book that that what they really objected to I and mean, i'll show you the front cover of the book and you know the front cover of the book some people would consider provocative because precisely because it's got a reference a visual reference to this havar havara transfer agreement which i think is quite central because these are ultra nationalist ideologies they also show that the relation of Israel to the oil state. They show some of the crimes of the IDF, including this very offensive T-shirt that IDF soldiers sold, which essentially is, is a, of a, it's a sniper scope over a pregnant woman wearing hijab because they always caricature, uh, you know, all the Palestinians as, as one Hamas and two extreme, you know, um, ideological Muslims. And whatever you think of that, that's just a trope they have. So a pregnant woman anyway in a sniper scope. And, and the slogan is one shot two kills. So they're, they're glorifying within the army the concept of murder of Palestinians, Palestinian women, Palestinian babies, even in utero. So these are the well-known crimes of the IDF and, the, and its outlook. So it's that exposition that the Zionists took offence to. But the police, you know, what's unusual is that if I tweet to the police and ask them to arrest the Zionists, they won't act, of course. But it, it seems that, you know, these Zionist groups have enough of a connection to the police and a part of that mechanism that they have been essentially asked to enforce political policing of what is a demonstration so there's a there's a concept that we have freedom of speech freedom of criticism but there's been a very active campaign to to criminalize and that really comes from governmental level doesn't it it comes from cabinet level and even prime ministerial level downwards in order to say we, what we want to do is continue this job of just as they did against jeremy really conflating you know anti-zionism with anti-Semitism, being against the, the politics and actions of a far-right extremist group and a state, which is currently, we're not sure even the numbers, definitely 30,000 killed, definitely 100,000 injured, but actually it's probably far more than that. And really, you know, it's an extension of our other criticism, you know, but we, we, we documented very extensively at the time of Jeremy Corden's leadership, and our difference politically, and you know, I'm in a different group, CPG, BML, we don't, we are not of a Labour tradition, right? But we saw clearly there was a huge groundswell of opinion in favour of Jeremy Corbyn when he was elected. People really were inspired. They very much hoped that, that Jeremy Corbyn would come to power, become the leader of a Labour government, a left-wing Labour government, and that would cause great change in the country. And quite clearly, lots of groups who thought that was possible got behind Jeremy. And I think, you know, it was the Labour Party machine in conjunction with the state 
that really deprived him of, he definitely should have been our prime minister, I think, at his first election. I think that's quite clear. And it was, it was around those issues that we really formed the, the Workers' Party to try and make a make a, a home I, when, when I formed the Workers' Party initially with George. So all of those issues about, you know, weaponizing anti-Semitism, not just to defend Israel, but actually to defend British imperialism, to defend the state against anyone who would threaten Britain's right to loot its colonies. It's, it's, it's very much the same part of the same project of the Iraq war, the destabilization of Libya and all the things that we, we I mean, know can about. I, can I just sort of, because I, I'm, I'm interested a little bit with, with, with the, the extent to which the police um, and the the government, it, the, them being an agency of the government, um, kind of went into intimidating you. I mean, you were arrested for and, and detained for, what, 24 hours? Detained 24 hours, then uh, there were four of us, and they, they raided our homes, they took electronic equipment, laptops, um, they took some literature from our houses, um, and then eventually they interviewed us, and ultimately they, they, they had to release us, but they released us on bail conditions, and those bail conditions were... I'm not to distribute any literature at a demonstration. If I go to a demonstration, so I was allowed to go, but I can't deviate from the prescribed route of march. And then lastly, it was not to have any swastikas in public. But of course, you know, a visual reference to someone else's ideology is not an approval of that ideology. And all of our history books have, are replete with those images. So that, but, but the kind of the idea was to kind of make it look as if I was a criminal and a far right activist and, and just kind of politically questionable. Uh, and and of course, about, they, what what about your your employers as well? Was it is it true that the police had contacted your employers? They did. So and, and they did. They, they're kind of quite slow to act. So initially, off that, they didn't straight away. Um, but actually, I mean, there was a subsequent demonstration on the thirteenth of January. I attended, and in line with my well, my bail restrictions, I just spoke. So I took a, a PA system, spoke to the crowd, but other people from my organisation, the CPGBML, they were there. Um, uh, and they were they were manning a stall, and then they were arrested this time under charges of the Terrorism Act because their leaflet essentially called for victory for the Palestinian resistance in their just war of liberation, which is kind of a, a leaflet we've been giving out for 20 years with slightly modified form. They said this essentially was the language of Hamas. It had a specific reference to this latest you know, escalation in the conflict, which is a 100-year-old conflict or 75-year-old conflict, depending on how you look at it. Um, and they said, oh, because it mentioned Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, which is not our name for it, but it's the name of this you know, operation. They said this is therefore giving support to Hamas and therefore you're aiding and abetting a terrorist uh, organization under Section 12 of the Prevention of Terrorism Act, or actually it's just called the Terrorism Act 2000. Um, this is punishable and, and can lead to a sentence of up to 14 years, 14 years in jail. Uh, so, so I wasn't arrested then because I just was speaking and I walked away, but my comrades were. And I went the next day on the 14th of January to Hammersmith Hospital where they were being held. And they were held for about 28, 30 hours. But I went there to try and get their release. And while I was there with my four-year-old son, um, you know, do nothing at all. Again, pe peaceful, speaking speak to people, just hoping to get them out and welcome them out and get, show them our solidarity and support for, for what they've been doing. They sent more police. They kind of surrounded me from behind. I think they waited for a moment when I put my son down in retrospect. And then about, there were about 10 or 12 police jumped me, handcuffed me, dragged me into the station again, and again charged me. This time, they said as the same offence as the one that my comrades inside had been arrested for, for terrorism. And again, it transpired that on both arrests, it had been this, this website, Harry's Place, who had essentially demanded the police act. And from outside the police station, it was Harry's Place who had contacted the police and told them I was there and I should be arrested. So they're literally, the police are being directed by political opponents of the Palestine Solidarity Movement to act really in, in you know, to, to criminalize protesters and in general, the, the movement um, and, and you, of, of support you, for Palestine. But you, you've, you've taken them on uh, legally and, uh, and what's happened? Since. So, I mean, the, the second time they, they bailed me, this time um, they bailed me with a very, very odd wording of their bail document. But essentially, they said you just can't attend demonstrations to, to the other comrades who were arrested, those three. They also said you can't leave the country and you can't enter the borough of Westminster. So really, it was quite, you know, quite draconian bail conditions. The first um, charge now has been totally dropped. Um, and that's for this book. So this book is officially legal now. They've decided that there's nothing in it. They've gone through its contents. I'm sure they've read it page by page. It's all history. A lot of it history is is, is the history of Jewish authors, Hara Arendt and Lenny Brenner, you know, or or even the, the verdict of Israeli courts, because in the Rudolf Kastner case, 
you know, um, both Eichmann and Kastner after World War II were tried. Um, well, I Eichmann was tried and Kastner was implicated in, in, um, in, in these courts. So all of them are, you know, findings even of, of Israeli courts. So there's really nothing in it which is reprehensible. There's nothing in it that's racist. It's an anti-racist racist text, an anti-Zionist text, which exposes their history. So that's all been dropped. Um, and, that, and for that reason, I think I will take the interview and I'll put it on YouTube because it's, it's, it's very worth watching. But immediately after the second arrest, they did contact my hospital. They contacted the, the GMC. Um, with, with, and they, of course, what they do is they say, you've been arrested twice. And they list all of the bail conditions, which when they put them all together, they look very sinister. Why is this man walking around with swastikas? Why is this man an anti-Semite? You know, so they, they make you think that there must be something terrible about what I've been doing. The police, Actually, I've been, the police. The police, the police yeah, and oh. the police have done that both to the, to the GMC, the GMC pass it on to the hospital. The police actually called social services. I was very concerned for the safety of my son when they arrested me. They left him running around on a main street in London in Hammersmith. And luckily, like my friends and comrades who were there, they looked after him, so he was fine. But I didn't know that at the time. So I was remonstrating with the police saying, where's my son, look after my son. And then when they established it was okay, and it was with a friend of mine who's a teacher, I said, that's absolutely fine. Though. And they kept on saying, no, no, we'll take him into social services. We'll take him in. And I, I managed to stop them doing that. And then later they contacted the social services and they said, this was a child who was at risk because I was taking him in, into an unsafe environment. So the police put him in danger. And then they contacted the social services to try and put the social service onto my wife and, and, and child. So they've contacted my work. They've contacted the social services. They've essentially tried to, you know, criminalize me. And actually, they don't have a legal leg to stand on. So we've had the first case thrown out entirely. The second case is still, we're awaiting the bail date is on, on the 28th of March. We have to go back to Hammersmith Police Station. So we'll go back. And I'm quite sure that we'll get it all thrown out. But in the meantime, there's also been articles published about me in the Jewish Chronicle, in the Daily Telegraph. So these are large papers without, you know, essentially mm. hurling accusations about slightly separate things, but, but trying to say that there's something unbalanced or racist about some of my action, which absolutely there is not, right? And and they, they hope that if you throw enough mud, some of it will stick, but maybe they'll get you sacked, they'll put you in a bad economic position, they can criminalize you. I'm still unable to attend demonstrations, so that has an impact on my ability to be where I want to be and express my my political opinion in norm in that what would should be, you would imagine, the, the democratic norms. Um, of society so really yeah, can the, I just, the, the most... I mean, i'm just thinking i mean about i'm just thinking you're a very articulate very um confident um professional surgeon i mean you're you're you know your people's lives are, 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 you know you you save people's lives i mean you you have a lot going for you in terms of not being intimidated as much as others i mean if someone didn't have your background they could never get through this, could they? I mean, it, it's a really tough thing that you've gone through. I mean, you're talking about it in a kind of matter of fact way, because you have that confidence and and in yourself. But other people could never have have, have tolerated what has happened to you. Well, I think that's probably right. That you're bitten off more than they can chew. Because I'm an activist. I'm a historian, really. I mean, I'm, it's like an, I'm an amateur historian, but I probably know more about history than I know about medicine because I've I've studied it. So I know that when I'm giving out the book, what I'm giving is is fact. There's nothing reprehensible in it. And I know also that my government is complicit in the genocide and even the leader of the opposition, you know, essentially are, are, are speaking out in favor of the genocide in in favor of Israel. And because precisely because and that's not and I don't have this idea that Israel is running Britain. I don't think that's right. I think Britain, Israel is a is a project of Britain. It was a project of Victorian politicians and the Balfour Declaration is a sign of that. And they brought it into being and they've used it and they've transferred the chief responsibility over to the US, but as the junior partner of US imperialism, our government, our business elite, our political elite are very much, you know, they're, they're in this project up to the hilt because it's a means by which they loot the Middle East of oil and keep control over that geostrategically and economically extremely important area. But you're right, because I know all these things, I'm not intimidated by the accusation of being a racist. I mean, I'm someone who, I mean, I don't, again, I don't look at, I was born in this country, my mother's English, but my father's Indian. I've known racism. I, I know what racism is. I've been an anti-racist campaigner. So to be accused of being racism, I'm not, I'm not Yale. I thought Yale's, you know, case was, was ex again, extremely powerful and articulate precisely because how can you call a Jew who's the, the, the you know, the, the, the daughter of people who are literally in Auschwitz? <laughs> how can you say that she's, a, she's an anti-Semite? And yet that's the accusation that they're making. And so this is the stock in trade of Zionism to weaponize anti-Semitism, 
And to say that any criticism of Israel and its crimes is by definition racism is anti-Semitism. And that's been ad adopted as a wider pattern and actually adopted by our ruling political class to deal with Jeremy and to get rid of him. And the Labour Party machine was absolutely complicit in that process, you know, which is why, you know, I absolutely appreciate that you and, and many of the people on the line will be longtime supporters of Labour, which, which I must say I haven't precisely because, you know, when I look at the history of the Labour Party and I'll just, you know, I, I am aware that it, it's always been split between this kind of a, a group of the leaders who were always complicit in the running of empire, who had avowedly said that they wanted to hand over the keys of empire at the end of their term and hand the empire back to to to, to the ruling class, to Britain, in a better state than they received it, and 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 also attack the working class and a, a mass of people who obviously gave it mass support, who thought it would achieve something different. And throughout my political time that I've been active, there's always been movements to reclaim Labour for its, you know, for for the concept that it's going to be a bit like what Jeremy Corbyn envisages it would be, you know, a vehicle for change, a vehicle for socialism. But historically, it's, you know, the reality is it's never it's never played that role precisely because. You know, at, a, at a very senior level, at the level of the party machine, at the level of the lords, of the ex-prime ministers, of the Blairs and the Browns and the Starmers, there's a machine which, and, and the Parliamentary Labour Party to an extent, there's a machine which has divorced its actual actions in, in administration from all of that. And so that, that's always been, that was why I've been in, involved, for example, in, in setting up the Workers' Party. And I very much wish, I don't know, I didn't see all of your conversation. I wanted to be there, but I'm sorry I missed it with Jeremy. I know George has recently called for Jeremy to come with him and form a large group of independents to form a block. And, and I do think that there will be a lot of independent standing and I, and I wish Jeremy would take him up on that. But I know Jeremy has been a long time loyal supporter of Labour despite the way the mm. Labour Party machine itself has treated him. Well, I wasn't going to ask him because I think it, it, he'd never, he wouldn't be very happy with me if I put that to him. So, no, And no. I'm not Jeremy Paxman, although I'm 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 getting towards his age now. But I, I, <laughs> That I really appreciate. I was only going to talk to you for ten minutes, but we talked for about half an hour or twenty five minutes. I'm later. really sorry if I've if no, I've no, gone on. Fine. I, 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 I appreciate... really appreciate your time, and it's been great to speak to you and all your um, I, I, all I your followers. What, I think it, I had to kind of unpick what you were saying because you're so confident that you you kind of threw away things like you'd been in custody for twenty four hours and they handcuffed you. And for for me, I'd be saying they handcuffed me, they put me in cut. you didn't even cut, yeah. you just put it away. It's oh, like, I mean, you know. it, is, it, it is amazing if you think that, you know, armed terrorist police, so about 15 of them on the second occasion, came to my house, they kicked my wife, who's a surgeon, my three kids, you know, um, my, my friend who's a teacher, her kid, all out of the house for their own safety, while they then walked away with a printer, black and white colour print, printer, black and white printer, and a couple of leaflets after staying here for 15 hours. So... You know, this is what you can see is, is even they by the end were bemused why they're being why they're being sent. They, they are people who think they're fighting terrorism, but are being used at a, from a high political direction to actually repress political freedom of speech and expression. So I think that's the biggest take home message that that affects all of us. And, and very clearly, they're worried about the strength and vibrancy of the Palestine solidarity movement. So I would just say, everyone, keep on doing what you're doing, because it's having an effect. And I think ultimately we can have victory, we can undermine their ability to wage this genocide and support this genocide, and it shouldn't be waged in our name. But thanks so much for speaking to me.